what is a Hoosier. None of the rest of you had kids at Hazeldell Elementary School in Noblesville. Oh my goodness, that chant, that song is kind of burned into my brain. We have five kids. I think I sat through the program where they sang that song, well, at least five times. I'll tell you what a Hoosier is not. It's not a team that makes it past the first round of the NCAA <laughs> tournament. Man. When we planned this series, well, first of all, I, I, I didn't think that there was a chance they were going to make it into the tournament necessarily. But then I got real hopeful. I thought, oh, maybe they'd make it a couple of games further than that. Man, the highlight from that game were the cheerleaders pulling the basketball off of the backboard. Man, man, man. I'll tell you what, uh, Daniel was doing some good-natured ribbing there just a second ago. My bracket is busted. Can anybody else relate to that? I had Iowa and I had UK all the way into the final four. I'm done. I'm done. I'm just playing out the clock uh, in this scenario. What is a Hoosier? So, uh, man, there are all kinds of stories surrounding this. And that song that I'm referencing my kids saying in those kids' programs, what is a Hoosier? Then one would chant out, born in Indiana. And then there are all these other little theories of what makes a Hoosier. But have you ever done the study of where that word comes from? I'll skip to the end. No one knows. No one really knows what a Hoosier is. Uh, the best story I've read, and there's all kinds of stories surrounding this, but the best story that I've read surrounds the wagon trains, like on the Oregon Trail on their way out west, and kids would get separated and lost from their kids and somebody, or from their parents, and somebody would look at them and say, Who's your mama? Who's your daddy? And somehow that stuck, and that's a Hoosier. I, I don't think that's true, but we really don't know. We don't know what reason there is for that. We're uh, doing this series, hashtag Hoosier One. And what I want to remind you, if you were here last week, or if you weren't, you're hearing this for the first time, this isn't so much about the basketball team Hoosiers. We're not focusing so much on the Hoosier side of the hashtag. Rather, we're focusing on the one side of the hashtag. Hashtag Hoosier One. The translation here, if I can just throw that up on the screen, it's asking the question literally, who is your one? There's good reason for us to ask this question because Jesus asks this question. Jesus, as we read through the New Testament, he sees the one. He oftentimes looks through the crowd and he locks eyes with the one. He sees individuals. He sees through barriers like gender and money, maybe cultural norms, to truly see the heart of the one. But do we? Do we really see people the way Jesus sees them? Do we even see people the way he sees us? We just celebrated that in communion. That Jesus looks through the crowd and he locks eyes with me and he locks eyes with you. He sees us. This series that we're in, we're, we're leaning into Venture's vision statement that we seek Jesus and we see you. This is what we're all about. So for the next four weeks, I hope you join us unapologetically. We're asking the question, hashtag who's your one? Who's the one that you're praying for? Who is your one that you, when you lay your head down on the pillow to sleep at night, your brain keeps going? And you think about that one person that you look through the crowd and you're locking eyes with. Maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's your coworker, maybe it's a family member, and you know that they're far from God. You know that their eternity is not secure. Who's your one? We're talking about this, and we're planting seeds for the next four weeks leading up to Easter. But actually, we're going to be talking about this a fair amount all year long. Before we go any further in this message, would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Let's invite God into this conversation. God, we pray as we pause, and we thank you that you're Lord and that you're Savior, that you have redeemed us just as we celebrated in that powerful moment of communion. We thank you that you look through the crowd and you see us. Lord, give us that same heart. Remind us that you, as you redeemed us, you seek to use us as we reach out to others. Hashtag who's your one. So as we're talking, as we're studying, Lord, 
We ask you, your Holy Spirit, just to simply whisper people in our ear, names that we need to hear, remind us who our one is. It's your name, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. How many of you, uh, maybe you like me, are a fan of the TV show Friends? How many of you, yeah, I see some hands going up there. And then you've got to pick your favorite couple. You've got Ross and Rachel. You've got Monica and Chandler. They're not a couple, but we can't leave them out. Joey and, uh, wait, I, I said it wrong, didn't I? You've got Ross and Rachel. You've got Monica and Chandler. You've got Joy. They're not a couple, but Joy and Phoebe. When I was uh, 20 years old, I, uh, 21, 22, Don and I were freshly married. This was a part of our weekly routine. We'd get together with a bunch of other 20-somethings. It was must-see TV on Thursday night. We would sit there and we would watch the TV show Friends. It wasn't until later that I realized that there was some bonus material. It wasn't just the genius of the writing of the sitcom writers, but they also put some creativity into the titles of the shows as well. You could find this if you Google it. You could look it up. I think there's even a Wikipedia article where even the first season and all the seasons after that, they named the shows creati creatively. Like for that first season, there was the one where Nana dies twice. The one. There's the one uh, where the East German laundry detergent. There's the one where Old Yeller dies. That one wasn't quite as funny. So for the next several weeks, join us as we lean into the one. We're going to be talking in a few weeks about the one, about the homeless naked man that Jesus looks through the crowd and sees. Today, we're going to talk about the one, about the goody two-shoes that Jesus looks through the crowd and sees. And then we're going to look at the one about the con artist that Jesus not only sees, but he invites himself over for dinner. Last week, we talked about the right one. This week, we're talking about the wrong one. We're going to unpack that word wrong here in a minute. Then next week, we're going to talk about the obvious one. The following week, it's about the invisible one. And then this week, the week right before Easter... Palm Sunday weekend, we're going to talk about the hurting one. Hashtag, who's your one? That's our ramp. That's our runway leading up to Easter. Can I remind you that Easter, if you've got people in your life who are living far from God, Easter and Christmas, these are great opportunities. Great opportunities for you to hashtag see your one. First, to identify them to invest in them, and then to invite them to be a part of the good stuff that God is doing in your life. Hashtag who's your one. You've got just a few weeks before Easter. We'll resource you on our way out today with some resources to help you toward that end. Today, today we're going to do a case study of two wrong ones. Look at two stories from the New Testament. This is a tale, if you will, of two rich guys, two men that Jesus looks through the crowd and he sees them, he sees into their soul. The first one is not named. The first one is actually his name is lost to history because he met Jesus and tragically he chose to go a different path. The second one, he met Jesus, he experienced life change and oh my goodness, they even wrote a song about him. Let's start first though with one, one, the first one. This is the rich young man. Actually, if you want to open up those Bibles that are underneath you and the seat in front of you, if you want to pull that out, I'm on page 1013 in those Bibles. Or if you've brought a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And it's titled in my Bible, The Rich Young Man. When I was a child, I learned this as the rich young ruler. That's kind of an older translation. So you're going to hear me today refer to this guy. I'm going to go back and forth. I can't help it. Talk about the rich young man, the rich young ruler. It's the same dude. Let's read about him. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him. Let's back up just for a second. On his way where? We're not exactly sure. But I want you to note that Jesus is going somewhere. He's on his way. In the middle, middle of the busyness of life, he pauses. He stops. Why? Because he sees the one. A man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. By the way, if you're thinking evangelism, <laughs> that's about as good as it gets. He runs up and falls on his knees in front of Jesus. It gets even better. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to get into heaven? He's literally asking the question. 
You talk about teeing it up right on a silver platter. Here you go. Well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. Jesus looks into him. He sees his heart through his eyes. He's getting at the heart of the issue here. He says, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. And then he lists a few of them. We'll talk about which ones here in a minute. He says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, don't defraud, honor your father and your mother. Okay. Teacher, he declared, all of these things I have kept since I was a boy. Check, check, check. I'm good, right? Jesus looked at him. Remember, Jesus looks through the crowd and he locks eyes with the individual. He sees this man and he loved him. There's a whole lot packed into that sentence. One thing you lack, he said, go, because he knows the heart of the man, he challenges him, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, then come on and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. Why? He went away sad, and it's almost like it's a foregone conclusion here. The text just states it very simply because he had great wealth. He counted the cost. He wasn't willing to do that. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This passage, Living in America, haunts me sometimes. How Uh, The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, well, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we've left everything to follow you. We we talked about this last week. The disciples were the right ones, right? I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. He's talking about homes and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields and with them persecutions, oh, by the way, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Man, there's a lot there. I want to unpack that with you. But first, can I remind you, can I challenge you, that you have one life. This is a play on words. We want to look at both sides of this coin. You have one life to invest for God. You have one life to leave it all on the court, so to speak, for your Savior. So, flip side of the coin, who's your one life? Who's the one life right now that you're just hyper-focused on, that you see them, just like Jesus looks through the crowd and he locks eyes with the rich young ruler? Who do you see in your life? Who's your one life that you're going to invest in? Well, first you're going to identify them, then you're going to invest in them, and then you're going to invite them to come and be a part of what God is doing in your life. You have one life to live, so who's your one life? Well, this, this man that we just studied, he, he was a wealthy man. He was a young man. His eyes were set on religious matters, on teachers, on eternal life, on good deeds. There's a series of mistakes that he makes, though, and I want to highlight those. There's four of those. If you're taking notes, write these down. The first mistake that he makes, he doesn't recognize that Jesus is the Lord. Perhaps you caught this. He referred to him as good teacher. He missed the lordship of Christ. We just celebrated communion. We recognize that Jesus is Savior, right? He saves us from our sins. He's also Lord. He wants us to do what he says to do. And when we fail, when we fall, when we fall to temptation, we fall to sin, we have to recognize the lordship of him in our lives and we repent and we return back to God. The first mistake this young man makes is he doesn't recognize that Jesus is in fact Lord. He wants to be the boss. He wants to be in control of his life. My favorite, one of my favorite Christian authors C.S. Lewis wrote about this a long time ago. He made it clear that Jesus is either, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. You can't have all three. If he says he's Lord, you have to follow him as Lord. 
He can't simply be another teacher. Here's the second mistake he makes. He was unaware of his own faults. He was unaware of the spaces that he was broken on the inside. Perhaps you noticed that Jesus listed some of the Ten Commandments for him. And the young man was saying, check, 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 I've done all of these. And at a cursory glance, it's like, what's going on here? But as you study that text and you look just a little bit deeper, the passages or the Ten Commandments that Jesus lifted, listed off for him that he knew this young man would be able to check off were the ones that talk about this relationship. Person to person. And the young man saying, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I'm not doing that one. But Jesus did not list those Ten Commandments that are about this relationship. The broken relationship between a person and their God. For example, you won't have any idol before me. You're not going to worship any false god for this young man. His false god was money. When Jesus suggests that there are other of the Ten Commandments for him to lean into and to live according to, he's not able to check off those lists. His second mistake was that he was unaware of his own faults. His third mistake was that he misunderstood the plan of grace. Mm. I wonder, I just wonder how many people misunderstand grace. I've gotten to baptize a fair number of people in my life, and I love the moment when I'm talking with somebody about faith, and I watch the light bulb go off when they realize that there's nothing that they can do to earn their way into God's heaven. There's nothing they can do to make it right before God on their own. Uh -uh -uh. We believe in grace because God extends grace. I don't have to earn my way back to God. No, no, no. He reaches out and redeems me. My job, if you will say it that way in this equation, is simply to receive his grace that he provides. I just wonder how many people inside of your sphere of influence do not understand this. Some of us maybe don't understand this. But as you think about people, hashtag, who's your one? Who's the one person that God's calling you to look through the crowd and lock eyes with and to see how many of them, if they could understand, if you could help them, if you could encourage them in this idea of God's grace covers over all of their stuff. They just have to reach out and receive his grace. If they could grasp that, oh my goodness, it could change their life. His third mistake, though, was he misunderstood the plan of grace. He didn't grab it. Here's the fourth mistake. He went away. He left. This might be actually his, his only mistake. We studied the disciples last week as the right ones. Well, they were on this journey for three years with Jesus. Three years they sat down at the dinner table with him. For three years they did life together with, them, with him. They were broken people. They sinned. They messed up. But they stuck with him and they followed him. And over three years' time, he taught them about grace. He taught them about what it's like to live the life with God. This man walked away. He did not have the opportunity to be a spiritual seeker, to just absorb what Jesus had to offer. He went away. Well, that's one of our ones. He makes four mistakes, this rich young ruler. I want to look now at another one. Here's one one. This is Zacchaeus. We, you know, the rich young ruler, he's not named in Scripture. We get his occupation, but we don't get his name. We get Zacchaeus' name and occupation. And I told you earlier, they wrote a song about him. I learned this song when I was just a little boy. It goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up into the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And then all the kids in the class go, and Zacchaeus, and they chant, you come down from going to your house today. How many of you know that song? You learned that song when you are man. The, I see a number of hands that go up in the air, and I notice that not one of you helped me sing that song. <laughs> you left me up here just on my own singing that. Thank you for that. I, I want to study. I want to study this text together. I'm on page 1052 in that Bible if you're following along there. If you've got your own Bible open in front of you, it's Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Here's another one. Same song Different verse, very different verse. Let's read. Jesus entered Jericho 
a wealthy community, by the way. This was the Hamilton County of the Middle East at that time. And it was passing through. Again, Jesus is on his way somewhere. But he stops and he locks eyes. He sees the one through the crowd. It's worth asking on this one, where is he going? Well, he's going to Jerusalem. He's walking from the Sea of Galilee down through the Jordan Plain. He's getting ready to walk up the ascent of Adamim, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. Why? Because it's the last couple of weeks of his life. He's going to pick a fight in Jerusalem at the end of that week. Well, it's what we celebrate with Easter. He's going to pick a fight with the Romans, and he's going to die a cruel death on a Roman cross to cover over your sins and mine and Zacchaeus. Oh, but we jump ahead. We haven't met him yet. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. collector. Not just a tax collector. He's the boss man. He's the chief. He's a wealthy man. And he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Jesus is looking through the crowd. Zacchaeus is looking through the crowd. Their eyes lock. But being a short man, he could not see Jesus because of the crowd. We have to stop here. We just have to stop for some short jokes. Zacchaeus was one of life's invisible people. It's not easy being short, so I hear. He'd probably heard all of the short jokes of his day. You know, like, I feel sorry for short people. When it rains, they're always the last to know. That's bad. What's, what's your best short joke? I'm a little bit on the tall side, and it's interesting to me that people who comment on height aren't usually on the tall side of life. My short friends talk about height. My tall friends don't usually talk about height. I recently heard of a tall dude who was six foot seven. I don't care who you are, that's tall. He had a friend that would always ask him, how's the weather up there? And he got tired of it once, and so he just spit on his head, and he said, well, it's raining. I asked Dawn, my wife yesterday, or day before yesterday, what, what's your best short joke? And she said, I don't know. Ask Yardstick. You don't get that joke. That's an inside joke in our family. We've got five kids, and four of them are adopted. It's hard to outrun genetics. And uh, so four of our kids, yeah, actually, we treated them for pretty short height, growth hormones and such, when they were little. And when one of my boys was, like, in first grade, he came home, and he was telling this story about one of the kids in his class that kept referring to him as yardstick. And we didn't get it until we poked a little bit further. And he was like, well, it's because a yardstick only has three feet in it, and I'm pretty short. I'm the same height, she says, as a yardstick. I didn't know if I should go to a first grade class and beat up a first grader or if I should slap high five with him because that's kind of a brilliant, creative nickname, right? Yardstick. Well, Zacchaeus might have told his own short jokes so that he could pretend that they didn't hurt. Zacchaeus, he couldn't make himself taller. He did the only thing he could do. He compensated. He vowed that he would be smarter, he would be richer, he would be meaner if need be than anybody else. This is Zacchaeus. Let's keep reading. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Jesus invites himself over into Zacchaeus' space. He sees him and he reacts. So he came down, Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter. This is what people do, the crowd, right? He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. As if that's a bad thing. This is a good thing. Hashtag, who's your one? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Jesus looked through his eyes and saw his soul. Zacchaeus recognized that exchange, and he responds in kind. Half of my possessions I give to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything because he had, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man, he's speaking of himself, came to seek and to save what was lost. He's saying, Zacchaeus, you were lost. You were far from God, but hashtag who's your one, now you're found. There's five coachings that I want to share with you from this story. If you're taking notes, write these down. Number one, this is so important. Anyone could be a one. Anyone. 
No one is beyond saving. We're told that Zacchaeus was a rich tax collector. We talked about this. Actually, he was the chief tax collector. New Testament Jericho was a wealthy community. This was the Hamilton County of Israel. Since Jericho was a center for the lucrative production of the export of balsam, if you're a Bible student, perhaps you've heard of the balm of Gilead. This is what we're talking about here. And it made people like Zacchaeus, who taxed wealthy merchants, it made him very rich. Tax collectors, though, were hated by the Jews. They were agents of the Roman Empire. They would increase fees, and they would get wealthy on the backs of their countrymen. And a matter of fact, the fact that he was a Jew made this a double betrayal. He was a traitor. He was a term coat, and his countrymen did not like him. But what did we say? Anyone could be a one, including Zacchaeus. No one is beyond saving. Number two. Here's a coaching from this story. Jesus' voice is recognizable. Zacchaeus, not only does he see Jesus, but he recognizes his voice as one who has authority. Listen. Listen for Jesus' voice and respond. It's my prayer that sometime through this series, as we're asking the question, hashtag, who's your one, that you hear the Holy Spirit whisper in your ear. What about this one? What about this one, my neighbor or my coworker or my family member? Who is it inside your sphere of influence who could be the one that Jesus is calling you to move toward? Listen to that voice because Jesus' voice is recognizable. Number three, confront your prejudices. Oh, the crowd, they were prejudiced, right? They saw Zacchaeus and they just kind of lumped him into this space over here. No one. No one should be outside of God's desire for grace and mercy over their life. Is there somebody, you think about them right now and you think, oh, I don't know, they're too far from God. I don't know if their life is redeemable. If that's the person you're thinking of right now, it's entirely possible God's calling you to lean in there. Hashtag, who's your one? Could it be that's your one? Number four. Jesus is both Lord and Savior. Jesus not only saves Zacchaeus, but he calls him to live a life under his lordship. That Jesus is boss. We talked about that just a little bit ago. Could I drive that down just a little bit deeper with us? Many of us, we live under Jesus' salvation. We recognize him as Savior. We're grateful that he saves us from our sins. Part of lordship is thinking like a Christ follower more. Part of lordship is saying, Jesus, you're the boss, and there's a whole half of the Great Commission. You're calling me to be a part of this great adventure that you're calling me on. That I'm supposed to look around and see people through the same eyes, through the same lens that you see people. Hashtag, who's your one? Who is it that I need to reach out to? Because this is a part of the lordship of Jesus that he's calling me to live. Number five, Jesus lived with purpose. You heard there at the end of the text we just read, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This, this is a purpose statement. He's saying, this is what I'm here for. And he's getting ready to march into Jerusalem and to prove it on the cross. Can I give you some homework this week? Open up your Bibles this week and read Luke chapter 15. Read it slowly two or three times. There are three stories that are told in Luke chapter 15 that illustrate the truth. Jesus loves lost things. He tells a story about a coin that's lost. He tells a story about a bunch of sheep, and he leaves 99. He leaves the safe and the comfortable and the saved, and he goes after the one. Hashtag who's your one. He goes after the one that's lost. He tells a story about a lost son. Hashtag, who's your one? Jesus loves lost things. Do you? Usually we read these passages and we place ourselves in the seat of the one, right? We think about the rich young ruler. And when I preach this, I do the same thing. I, I typically tend to apply truth from Scripture, focusing on the rich young ruler's actions, what not to do, what to do. Or like we look at Zacchaeus and we say, how do we be more like him? We put ourselves in the seat of the one. But what I want to do with the little bit of time that we have left is ask the question, 
How do we be more like Jesus in these stories? How do we see the one? How do we interact with the one? It's a tale of two rich guys. One of them chooses to follow Jesus, one doesn't. So let me ask the question, what's wrong with these ones? It's the title of the message, right? The wrong ones. What's wrong with these ones? Well, let me cut to the the chase. Nothing. Nothing is wrong, not from the perspective of the giver in the story. I mean, we can critique the receiver, right? We can critique the rich young ruler, what he didn't do, what he should have done. But the giver, Jesus, he looks through the crowd, equal opportunity, both of these men. He looks through the crowd and he saw with compassion. He sees the one and he calls us to do the same. So what's wrong with these ones? Nothing. Here's several reasons why. First of all, because they're us. Hmm. Hamilton County is filled with wrong ones. I mean, you can't spit into the wind without hitting a rich young ruler or a Zacchaeus. By world standards, they're wealthy, but Jesus saw them anyway. So let's talk about our mission field, shall we? Let me share with you some Hamilton County statistics. This is something that will likely shock nobody in this room. Hamilton County is the richest county in Indiana. What might be a little startling is just how much wealthier the residents are here than the average Hoosier. According to a publication, it's called 24-7 Wall Street. This was reported in the Indy Star. I found an article from January 2020, right before the pandemic hit. At that point, the median annual household income in in Hamilton County is 20, or or, I'm sorry, 94,644 annual compared to the state average of 54,325 annual household income. Hamilton County is 43% higher than the rest of the state. The poverty rate in Hamilton County is 4.7. Statewide, it's 14.1%. Unemployment, 2.3 in Hamilton County compared to 3.2 for the rest of Indiana. That's a bit of a dated stat. I'm not sure exactly what it is now, but I think it still bears up percentage-wise. Hear me. The rest of the state views us as the rich young ruler. True story. When I left Bloomington, Hoosiers, and moved up to Hamilton County to serve a church in Carmel, 2007, I'll never forget several conversations. One of them I'm thinking of vividly right now in the lobby of the church that I served down there, great church. A guy that I respect and know walked up to me and said, hey, where are you going? We're going to Carmel. And the look on his face, I'll never forget it. It it was a look of disgust. (laughs) He said, Carmel? Why in the world would you want to move to Carmel? And then I think he muttered something about a bunch of rich people. Hear me, though. That was 15 years ago. And I've come to think of this as my mission field. This is where God has called me to serve. If you live here, hear me loud and clear. It's your mission field as well. Globally, my goodness, our entire country is wealthy. I uh, look up some stats, World Vision, about 9.2% of the world, or 689 million people live in extreme poverty on less than $1.90 a day, according to the World Bank. That same article told me that 34 million people live in poverty in our country. That's 10.5% of the population. The poverty line is $12,880 a year. That's $35.28 per day. I was talking through some of those stats with one of my high school boys who has a part-time job, high schooler. By those statistics, my high school son is a wealthy man. Rich young ruler, right? So I'd ask the question, what's wrong with these ones? Well, first of all, nothing. They're us. Second of all, They're our neighbors. Hear me, wealthy people need Jesus too. Wealthy people have hurts and habits and hang-ups too. Wealthy people can be living far from God as well. Wealthy people have more resources, though, to insulate themselves from the sting of loneliness. But wealthy people need Jesus. And some of them are the rich young ruler. And some of them are Zacchaeus. You don't know. So don't prejudge your neighbors. You don't know which one is a ruler and which one is Zacchaeus. So what's wrong with these ones? Nothing. They're our neighbors. And only God knows which one will accept 
his invitation. The moral of that story is we're called to invest everywhere we can. You don't know which one will accept God's invitation to follow him. Zacchaeus did. The rich young ruler didn't. You ever wonder about the rest of the story? What happened to Zacchaeus from that moment forward? We don't really know. By the way, the scriptures do not call this out. What I'm getting ready to share with you, this is an opinion. We can't bear this out as absolute gospel truth. What's the rest of the story? Well, he was the chief tax collector, not just a tax collector, but the boss. But his encounter with Jesus, oh, it dramatically changed his life. Did he he follow Jesus from that point to Jerusalem? We don't know. Did he witness the triumphal entry or the the crucifixion? We don't know. Was he one of the 120 on the day of Pentecost? Or maybe was he a part of the crowd that Peter preached to on that day? 3,000 responded to his message. I could certainly see this transformed man going to Jerusalem and being a part of this experience. We don't really know. This is opinion again, but we don't know this for certain. But early church tradition would suggest that Zacchaeus, actually he left the wealthy community of Jericho, and tradition would say that he went to the wealthy community on the sea of Caesarea. Caesarea Maritima, and there, according to Christian tradition, maybe he became the first bishop. And he led God's people there. There's another theory about what happened to him. It's St. Clement of Alexandria said this, that, Alexand- that Zacchaeus rather became Matthias. We talked about the right ones last week. We looked at da Vinci's Last Supper painting, and we talked through what happened to the disciples. Perhaps you remember that Judas died. He was replaced by a guy named Matthias. St. Clement of Alexandria says that, Z- that Zacchaeus actually is also known as Matthias. He became one of the 12 apostles that went out and did incredible things for God. We don't know that to be true. That's more an opinion. That's more a rumor. But here's the thing. Imagine what God probably did through his life from that moment forward. We're asking the question, what's wrong nothing. Because Jesus wants to come to Zacchaeus' house today, and he wants to come to somebody inside of your sphere of influence, to their house today. Yesterday, a group of us met, and we dreamed together, about 25 of us in a room. We talked about this hashtag, who's your one idea? What would happen if each one of us got serious? And we prayed, and we trained up, and we did some dreaming about who's our one and how can we reach our neighborhood, reach our families, reach our community more for Jesus. And I did a little math, and I thought, oh, my goodness, if 25 people in this room catch this, that's 25 more people whose family trees could maybe be changed forever. In the spirit of Zacchaeus, who knows what God might do with those Hoosier ones? I do the math in here, and I think about the broader circle of our church. What would happen if each one of us went after one and that person went after one? My goodness, we could change the world. No, God could change the world in us and through us. So, hashtag, who's your one? Three action steps I'll send you out here with. First of all, identify. Hashtag, who's your one? Who is it inside your sphere of influence that Jesus wants to come to their house today? Hashtag who's your one? Identify. Invest. Invest in that person. God would use you toward that end to come to their house today. Number three, invite. Hashtag who's your one? We want to create more of a culture of invitation here. Toward that end, would you stand up with me? I want to send you out of here with some resources. We we looked at the runway, Easter is coming. We also kind of teased out the idea that there are people inside your sphere of influence who are far from God. You know they are. Easter, Christmas, these are times when people sometimes will accept that invitation to just come and be a part of what God is doing in your life, to see what God is up to in your life. Hashtag who's your one. So you've got a few weeks now. We want to resource you well toward that end. I shared with you last week, we've got this space out in the lobby. You can stop by there. There are invitations there. Please take as many as you will. Use them to identify, to invest, to invite. 
You'll notice this week as you leave and look out there, there's actually a uh, QR code. If you just take your smartphone and put it over that, it's going to bring up a web page filled with resources that you could use as digital resources to email somebody and invite them or to use it on your social media to invest and invite. Would you do that this week? Last week I send you, sent you out with this idea of a reticular activator, and I'd remind you of that. I wonder how that's going for you this week. It's that piece in your brain that causes you to see the things that you're looking for and then to notice them maybe when you weren't noticing them before. This week, I pray that as we scan the crowd, we look through the crowd and we lock eyes with the one. Hashtag, who's your one? Perhaps you're here today and you've got a decision to make. You simply want somebody to pray with you. My friend, Pastor Tony, will be hanging out under the cross. If you're our guest today and you want to know more about what our church is about and why we love our church, I'll be hanging out at Starting Point. I'd love to meet you there afterwards. For the rest of us, God bless you, Venture. Have a great week. We'll see you back again next Sunday.